Good morning. Welcome to you one and all. Kids, how are the how is the first day of Sunday school today? All right. And adults. And thank you for all of your flexibility as we work on the the basement situation. I think things worked out today. And we were told it would be cool in here, but it's uh Oh, this isn't even on. I say it's probably what, 68. 67, comfortable, praise the Lord. So a special welcome to everyone who's visiting today, um, and to all of you, welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus. Shirley is here, oh my goodness. (laughs) Welcome, Shirley. I heard you were in town, so so glad you're here today. We'll have to all catch up with her after the service. Welcome to those watching online as well. We're going to do a responsive prayer to open our service today. The words will be on the screen. You can remain seated for this prayer. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth (coughs) shall declare your praise. Lord, open our hearts, and our feelings shall know your love. Lord, open our minds, and our thinking shall discover your wonders. Lord, open our hands, and our giving shall show your generosity. Lord, open our lives, and our living shall declare your presence. Today, the call to worship is from Psalm 95. It says this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving 
and extol him with music and song. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Yet she left the gates of angels came to seek and save the lost and exchange the joy of heaven for the anguish of the cross with the prayer you fed the hungry with the word you still the sea yet how silently you suffered that the guilty you're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. With a shout you rose victorious, resting victory from the grave. When I sing that song, I imagine the love of God in us spreading out across all the places we live, our families, our workplaces, our friend groups, and the gospel, the, the, the message of salvation um, goes out every time we leave this place. This song, Only a Holy God. Um, uh, we've sung it a few times here before. I know for me, I tend to think of God's holiness as his power, as something scary sometimes. But this song, where this song lands is that because God is a holy God, he's a good father. And he calls us his children uh, through Jesus Christ. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty Splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. 
our holy God as we receive the offering today and sing the doxology. praise you, by listening to you, by giving you these gifts. So we just say glory to your name. We love you. And we, uh, we adore you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We have one more song to sing this morning. You can stay seated as we sing, Just As I Am, number 488. Just as
I just want to pray for us as we um, come out of that song. Lord, what a, what a miracle it is that we can be accepted just as we are with our problems, with our doubts, our troubles, our fears, our imperfections, our sin. Yet you've made a way for us to come to you through Jesus and his gift of grace through his death on the cross and his saving work. Uh, so thank you, Lord. We, I think of all the situations in our lives and all the places we're at spiritually here, and I thank you that um, we're all um, equal in your sight, and we can come to you uh, through Christ alone. So Lord, continue to accept our praises and, and be with us as we uh, prepare to hear from your word in a few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. A few announcements this morning um, in, uh, before we head on to the sermon. Um, again, welcome to Shirley. We're so glad you're here. Um, birthdays. Yes. Alexis. Uh, tomorrow's Colin Congress birthday. The next day is Brody Edgerby's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the 14th is Layla Goodcock's birthday. So we definitely need to sing. A happy birthday! Some exciting um, church family news that isn't in the bulletin. Um, next Sunday, right after church, 12, we'll say 12.30, we're having a baptism. Um, Eva, Eva Bior will be baptized down at the lake at um, the Digby's camp. Um, I don't see Heather and John today, but we'll, we'll make sure you have the address for that. Um, just down in Georgia Shore. So um, we're excited for Ava, and I hope you can, as many of you as possible, can come to, to witness uh, this point in her life and her journey of faith and um, share in uh, affirming the baptism that she will undergo. Well, hopefully the lake will still be warm enough by then. It's supposed, it's supposed to be in the 70s and 80s this week. So, um, And hey, it, if there's anyone else who let's say is over 10 who wants to be baptized, um, come and talk to me and it might work out next Sunday. Okay, also the last Sunday of September is our Membership Covenant Renewal Sunday. The first one of these we've had since we initiated this in 2021. Every three years, the members of our church reaffirm their covenant together. It's a covenant we make with one another. Um, so you can see those, the blue papers on the back table have our membership covenant on them. And what we're going to do is ask you to take one of those sometime between now and the 29th. And then on the 29th, return it with your signature indicating your reaffirmation of our membership covenant. Um, any questions you have about that, talk to me or talk to Brian Kinsman, the chair of the deacon board. Um, continue to uh, pray that our basement mold situation will be, will be fixed soon. Um, we're hopeful that it will be, and only a, f a few more Sundays of, of creative classroom space for Sunday school will be needed. So, yes, Katie. Yeah, and tonight for the business. Yeah, this morning we'll have nursery in the vestry, I think. Oh, perfect. Outside, okay. So, yeah. Yep, three and under. Four, four and under, excuse me, four and under nursery. Thank you, Katie. Any other announcements? Oh, um, yes, any other before I transition to the World Mission Offering video? Okay. So we have a video to show you about the World Mission Offering. We are um, collecting 
uh, donations for this offering through the month of September to support the work of um, the church around the world, church planting, church strengthening, disciple making, helping churches reach their local communities. So let's see an example of what is being done with that. and I've been working with international ministries for over 20 years. I've always had a desire to follow God's call, and in following that call, He brought me here in Mexico, where I've been working with those who are vulnerable and, and, and who are suffering. And part of that work has been as a seminary, and that includes walking alongside people and listening to their stories. So one of the greatest needs that we found was the lack of access to theological education. Many of our countries, our partner and partner countries, uh, do not have the resources to provide a master's in theological studies. In 2016, a group of global servants started to collaborate with Palmer Theological Seminary, and we started what was the master's in theological studies. Uh, it may seem very common now that there's a lot of online education, but at that time, we were one of the first to offer a, a master's in theological studies online. My name is Jay Stockton. I'm an information technologist serving at the Baja region in Mexicali at Baptist Theological Seminary. I first felt God calling me for global ministries during a mission conference back in 2006. Now, I'm serving alongside international ministries for almost three years. I love how um, international ministries has the heart of Jesus in everything they do. We are partnered with local churches and sharing God's love, teaching, equipping, and walking alongside them. Almost everything in this world now, it uses technology. And so most of our students, they're technically challenged uh, when it comes to using computers. I'm here to help them uh, do problem solving with their technical needs so that they can focus more on their studying, you know, and allow them to uh, be equipped and teach others to do the same. <laughs> I am filled with compassion whenever I get the chance to serve and help students and people in the community towards making Christ to be center of their lives. Through this partnership, we are meeting the needs for higher education right where the leaders live. Brazil, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Mexico, people that live in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And soon we're going to have groups in Chile and Guatemala. These leaders are so passionate about spreading God's word. And they are now more equipped to empower and educate up-and-coming leaders in their home communities. Every year we start our cohorts with a residency week. And that week is so important because that's when we become a community. And I get to see the passion in our students. And watching passion in them, it reignites the passion in me of why we do this ministry. God is preparing leaders who will go out to prepare other leaders. And that is so important. When you give to the World Mission Offering, you are joining us to extend theological education to other partner countries. You are making a difference. You are changing the world. Please give. How amazing is it that we here in Georgia, Vermont can be part of training pastors in Mexico or Brazil or Guatemala to uh, extend the kingdom of God. So through our prayers and our giving, we can be part of that. Let's turn our attention now to the reading of God's word.
Today's reading is Mark 12, 18 through 27, and that can be found on page 824 in your pew Bibles. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. This is the word of God. Thank you, Marie. Let's pause and pray once more. Oh, Lord, uh, you're the God who inspired these words to be written by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that through them we can be transported back to this conversation between Jesus and and this group of people, and we can learn. So help, uh, Lord, provide clarity, provide understanding, provide conviction, provide encouragement, and do all this work in us uh, for the sake of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. If anything seems strange to you about what was just read, I promise that it will be a little less strange in about 25 minutes. I want to begin with a modern-day parable. Nobody quite knows where it comes from, but you've, some of you have probably heard this before. It goes something like this. In a mother's womb were two babies. The first baby asked the other, Do you believe in life after delivery? The second baby replied, Why, of course. There has to be something after delivery. Maybe we are here to prepare ourselves for what will be later. Nonsense, said the first. There's no life after delivery. What life would that be? I don't know, but there will be more light than here. Maybe we'll walk with our legs and eat from our mouths. The doubting baby laughed. That's absurd. Walking is impossible. And eating with our mouths? Ridiculous. The umbilical cord supplies nutrition. Life after delivery is to be excluded. The umbilical cord is too short. The second baby held his ground. I think there is something, and maybe it's different than from here. The first baby replied, No one has ever come back from there. Delivery is the end of life, and in the after delivery it is nothing but darkness. Well, I don't know, said the twin, but certainly we will see mother and she will take care of us. Mother, the first baby guffawed, you believe in mother? Where is she now? The second baby tried to explain, she's all around us. It is in her that we live. Without her, we, there would not be this world. Ha, I don't see her, so it's only logical that she doesn't exist. To which the other replied, sometimes when you're in silence, you can hear her. You can perceive her. I believe there is a reality after delivery, and we are here to prepare ourselves for that reality when it comes. That's a good story, isn't it? The parallels are amazing. In this passage, we see Jesus talking to people who don't believe in life after death. They're called the Sadducees. We'll learn more about them in a minute. They do not believe in heaven, resurrection, 
anything. They believed that when you died, life was over. You went down to the grave to rest with your ancestors. That's it. They come to Jesus with a bogus question, trying to prove the absurdity of belief in the resurrection, in life after death. Um, And I have good news for us this morning. They're wrong. Jesus says twice, you are in error and you are badly mistaken. So their error is good news for us because Jesus says there is life after death. So this morning we're going to look at the question they ask and the way Jesus sets them straight. Now, like the Sadducees, we probably all have some wrong beliefs about what life after death is like. Chances are most of us here today believe There is something later. We believe in heaven and hell, for example. Some of us maybe don't. Um, But we all have some wrong beliefs about what life after death is like. They come from movies and books and songs we listen to and conventional wisdom and superstition and intuition. And we need Jesus to set us straight. Now in this passage, as I'm sure you noticed, this does not tell us everything we need to know about life in eternity. But it does correct a few misperceptions, and it shows us um, the key concept that we need to understand. So, so let's see what we can learn as we see the, the Sadducees' question and Jesus' response. And uh, open your Bibles, if you would, if they're not open already, to Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 18. We read, The Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. This is not an honest question. They're trying to trap Jesus. They are trying to throw a monkey wrench in his mission. Last week, we saw the Pharisees come to trap him with a political question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now we see the Sadducees, another religious party, trying to trap him in a theological question. Here's what you need to know about the Sadducees. They were wealthy, powerful leaders of the temple, mostly high priests and their families. Theologically, they only accepted the first uh, five books of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The books of Moses. Everything after that, they did not trust was the word of God. And now, um, one of the things that you see in the books after the first five is the idea of the resurrection from the dead. In the first five books, all you see, all they seem to understand was a place called Sheol, which is a a shadowy place of nothingness where you'd go when you die. That seems to be what what people believed in. Um, No heaven, no resurrection, no life, no hope after the grave. Which sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? That's, as the joke goes, that's why the Sadducees were sad, you see. That's a good way to remember what they believed. <laughs> so they, they concoct this question as a, as a theological hand grenade that they're hoping will blow up in Jesus' face. Verse 19, Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother, which is true. There's a law in the Old Testament and uh, uh, Deuteronomy that, um, that if a, a, a man dies before having children, his brother needs to marry his wife and produce offspring that will be counted to the dead brother's family line. It was partly to protect widows from destitution, but also to continue the family line and the inheritance and the land allotment. It was a big deal for them. Continuing on. Now there were seven brothers, they say. 
The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married and widow, uh, the widow, but he also died leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Now here's their kicker. Uh, sorry, last of all, the woman died too. And now, at the resurrection, which they don't believe in, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? It's supposed to be a, it's supposed to show the absurdity of this idea of the resurrection. Um, I mean, imagine the day the woman and all seven men are standing there and the first one says, she's my wife. I was married to her first. No, she's my wife. I was the last one married to her. She's my wife. She liked me the best. She told me, right? You just have this absurd situation where you have to decide whose wife uh, who does this woman go with? Um, but we see how Jesus, b- before we see how Jesus answers, um, I want to draw a connection line to today. There are plenty of secular people out there uh, who don't believe in life after death, like that f- second baby in the womb. Um, now, it, if you believe that all that exists is this material world, you know, we're we're highly evolved creatures living in an accidental universe where all all that is is matter and space, why would you believe there's anything after your body dies? You know? I know many people like that. My own grandfather once wrote to me in a letter, after I die, I believe that it's just lights out. No more me. And it's easy for critics like the Sadducees to poke fun of the idea in the idea of heaven. Heaven is easy to make fun of, right? Like, oh, so you're going to sit on a cloud with a harp for all eternity? Like, clearly that's just some Sunday school, like, fairy tale answer. Come on. Have you seen the, uh, the Far Side comic from years ago where this, this guy with, with wings is sitting on a cloud looking off into space and the thought bubble says, sure wish I'd brought a magazine. <laughs> you know, like, it's easy to imagine heaven as this boring place of eternal monotony or sing a giant worship service that goes on for eternity. And it's easy to characterize it and to poke fun at it. Then again, um, there are also many Christians who have bad ideas about what heaven is like. As a pastor, I work with folks when they're grieving and performing funerals and burials for people in the community. And I hear many interesting comments about what people believe about the afterlife. Some people believe that when their loved ones die, they become angels. Like, I guess God must have needed another angel. That's why she took, that's why he took Joe. Many people talk about their loved ones communicating with them beyond the grave. God sending an animal to, to, you know, show that this person is watching over them. Or, uh, or, praying to their loved ones for help. Many people talk about heaven as a place of family reunions, right? Um, I'm just glad that mom and dad are finally together again, which isn't necessarily wrong, but if that's the only thing that you think heaven is about, then you're mistaken. In the wider culture, there are many more views. A significant number of Americans believe in reincarnation. That is, after we die, we are reborn as another human being or another creature, and the cycle goes on and on. Um, Some people believe that we become one with the universe or that our spiritual energy continues to exist in some form, um, or that we can come back to haunt people we... uh, Loved or didn't love, as the case may be. Um, And about a fifth of Americans believe that there's nothing at all. 
This is a 2021 survey, a fifth of Americans. And you, you know people who hold all these different views. Some of you have, have some of these views. So let's see how Jesus answers the Sadducees and how that can speak to us. We read beginning in verse 24. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? That's quite an accusation. I mean, these are guys who spend their lives studying the scriptures. This is like telling Aaron Judge, you don't know how to swing a bat. He's a Yankees player. <laughs> Thanks, Asher got it. Um, right? I mean, he's telling religious professionals, you don't know the scriptures. You're in error. You're wrong. You're way off base. The scriptures or the power of God. And Jesus corrects them on two points. First, about the nature of the resurrection and then on the reality of the resurrection. Look at verse 25. <clears throat> when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. You see, the Sadducees were picturing the resurrection as sort of a life rebooted, a life 2.0. Just like everything was back to normal. And so we continue to marry and have children and, uh, and build our families and do all the things that we're used to. And it's easy to, to look at that and say, absurd, right? But Jesus says, no, uh, this is not the case. We'll be in a whole new kind of existence. Um, in our resurrected body, which is some ways indescribable. Notice how Jesus says what it is not. He says, um, th they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Things won't be like they are now. It's not just life rebooted. And then he compares the resurrected life to something else. They will be like the angels in heaven. Angels don't get married. They don't have children. They're not within this earthly realm. Now, Jesus is not saying we become angels. He says they will be like the angels in that we're not uh, marrying and having families and, and continuing on with human affairs in that sense. He's saying that we'll be in a new kind of reality that's not just an upgraded version of life here and now. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul builds on this idea. He compares our earthly bodies to a seed and our resurrected bodies to a, the plant that grows from it. So there is continuity. We are the same thing and yet gloriously different right? Unimaginably different and better and more beautiful and glorious, fit for heaven. Transformed. That's what Jesus says about the nature of the resurrection. Second, Jesus corrects them about the reality of the resurrection. Verse 26. Now about the dead rising... Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Again, their mistake is good news for us, because they didn't believe in any of this. Remember, they only accepted the books of Moses, so Jesus meets them on their ground in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, when Moses sees this vision of, of God speaking to him from a bush that was on fire but not burning up. And who did God say he was? I am the God of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, what conclusion does 
Jesus draw from that? Well, when God spoke those words to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. They were not still walking around. But, in a sense, God is saying, they're still alive to me. God is not the God of corpses. The living God is God of the living. God still had a relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that was alive because of his covenant to them. So to know God, the very source of life itself, is to have life, whether on this side of the grave or on the other side of the grave. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. God is more than able... You see, the Sadducees did not know the power of God. That God is able to hold someone's life through death. And, and that to know Him is to know life itself. He's able to raise decayed and dead bodies or bodies turned to ashes. He's able to take those and refashion them into something new and glorious as they continue from life with him to life in the resurrected state. Some of us really need to hear this today, I think. If you're feeling, if you're feeling your age, if you're wondering, how many more years do I have left? If you're facing terminal illness, if you're grieving the death of a loved one, you might need to hear that God is the God of the living. And God can hold your life through death. You're still alive to Him. There's hope beyond the grave. If you belong to God through Jesus, you have nothing to fear about death and everything to hope for. Isn't that good news? I mean, we live in a world that is just haunted by death everywhere we look death and dying and disease and things falling apart and our bodies falling apart god is stronger than death he's able to uh as john says uh, sorry as as jesus says I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. In Jesus, we have life. Now, the famous um, philosopher Rene uh, Pascal, Blaise Pascal, um, he was a philosopher, a mathematician. He spent his life studying theology and he was very smart but he he had been reading about god and learning about god for decades one night he encountered god he was home alone in his his room in his house he began to pray and he he wrote in his journal about 11 o'clock at night fire holiness the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm paraphrasing, love like I've never felt before. Oh Lord, let this feeling not stop. Because he encountered the living God. After he died, people found stitched in his shirt a scrap of paper with, that, with those words written on it. That he would always remember that encounter he had with the living God. You see, to know God is to know life itself. To know the source of life the, and the power of God. And this accords with what Jesus says about heaven. If, you know, it's, if our relationship with God is there, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these mortal men who knew him and were known by him, then God is also the God of Sarah and of Don and of Nikki 
and of Rebekah. And the living God holds those he knows and is able to raise them from the dead. As Jesus says in John 17, 3, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Do you see how Jesus corrects the Sadducees in their mistaken and hopeless belief that there's nothing after death? But it also corrects some things we believe, too. Because the main thing about heaven is God. It's not about seeing pets again. I'm not sure if we'll be able to. That'd be kind of cool. It's not even mainly about family reunions. It's certainly not about sitting on the cloud playing a harp, thank God. (laughs) It's resurrection. That means physical, real life in a real new creation. It, it, gloriously transformed and different from the life we know now with death and suffering and pain and loss, but real resurrection. As I said earlier, this passage does not tell us everything we need to know about life beyond the grave, but um, Jesus also gives us the key to understanding everything we can about life beyond the grave. And there is much to learn. Did you see what he said? Why were the Sadducees in error? They didn't know the scriptures or the power of God. Friends, if you want to know what heaven is like, read your Bible. Just read it. Study it. Soak in what God says. Don't get your idea of heaven from TV or Books about people traveling to heaven, supposedly, or what people say. Get, let God tell you what resurrection and heaven is like. And what we've tasted today is just one small part, just one portion of Scripture. So continue to read and study. Let Scripture form your vision of the life hereafter. Not only so you can believe the truth, but so that you can give hope to others and correct faulty beliefs that, that don't have hope in them. Well, Jesus corrects some wrong thinking about the afterlife, but the ultimate proof of what Jesus says happens five days after this, doesn't it? This was Tuesday of Holy Week. In five days, he would actually come out of his tomb with resurrection power to be the first ever human being living in a resurrected body that will never die. That's why we can have hope. Not just because of what Jesus says, but because of what he did and who he is. If you trust in him, you have hope. And your resting place is not the sweet by and by or the, on a cloud or somewhere beyond the blue. Your final home is in the resurrected creation with a resurrected body and a resurrected Christ. So listen again to Jesus' words in John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question I want to leave you with. Do you believe this? Do you believe what Jesus says about life after death? Do you believe that he is the resurrection? Let's pray. Jesus, we we want to believe you. We want to um, hear your words and let them replace and clear out uh, mistakes we have about the afterlife. 
We want you to form in us a true and hope-filled and accurate um, perception of what heaven is like. So I pray that you do that work in us as we read your scriptures and as we uh, believe and trust in your power. Let's pray this prayer of confession now that will be on the screen as we continue in prayer this morning. Saying together, Gracious God, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts of this world. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see that all the things we pine for are shadows, but you are the substance. That they are quicksands, but you are mountain. That they are shifting, but you are anchor. We plead your forgiveness on the merits of Jesus Christ. Accept his worthiness for our unworthiness his sinlessness for our transgressions, his fullness for our emptiness, his glory for our shame, his righteousness for our dead works, his death for our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we continue in prayer. Um, receiving your mercy and your grace. Thank you so much. Thank you for the oceans of mercy that you give us. Thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve, but as far from the east is from the west, you have removed our transgressions from us. Thank you that you've opened the door to heaven, Lord. And someday we will truly understand what a gift that is. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And Lord, we pray that the hope of the resurrection would, would be um, just, uh, would spring out of our lives here. I pray for those this morning who are suffering in their bodies with illness, with pain, with the dread of death, as in some ways all of us are. are. Lord, give us hope. Give us hope. Give your people your resurrection hope. Help us to know the scriptures and the power of God. And we lift up others who are sick or suffering in some way and ask, as we say their names, we ask for you to bring your resurrection hope to them. Amen. Amen. Mm. Lord, we know that by your Spirit you can do things for these people that we cannot. So we pray that you would. Pray that you would move and act. Lord, we also lift up our nation. We think of the community in the state of Georgia where there was recently the, the shooting at the high school. And Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us and have mercy on those who are grieving. And bring your hope to them. Lord, we pray that out of this tragedy, there would be um, many gospel opportunities and much um, 
God, we know you can take what is evil and turn it into good. So please do that. And Lord, we pray for um, the world mission offering and the work of international ministries, especially this morning in the area of theological education. We pray that many pastors would be raised up to serve their communities um, in places where there is poverty and conflict and um, lack of access to the gospel. So Lord, would you help us to be generous and would you bless that mission? We pray for our own church and our own community, Lord, that um, you, your will would be done through us. Bless the Sunday school year as it begins and we pray that every child and adult would grow in their faith and their knowledge of you and that you would help us uh, the teachers and everyone, that, that we would have a great Sunday school year with growth and learning and um, people understanding you for the first time and responding to you in faith and repentance and people growing deeper. And now let's pray and actually sing the Lord's Prayer together. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you.